Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a Fireside Chat. The Fireside Chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum in Chicago, United States. Tonight, I am in Tromsø, Norway. I am Doug O'Keefe, host and producer of the Chats. My guest this evening is Tromsø's own Lady Di, also known as Rune. And I'm very, very, very pleased and very honored to be able to conduct this interview. So, Lady Di, how are you finding Tromsø this evening? Um, slightly dry. Dry? Yes, it's, it's not sludging down. Usually it's always really shitty weather during Arctic Pride, so I didn't have to wear my fancy umbrella this evening. So I'm, <laughs> I'm quite happy, yes. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about where you're from and a little bit about your family, you're coming out. Well, right, right. So um, I, I wasn't born and raised here in Tromsø, the north of Norway. I was born down in the south, uh, not too far from the capital. And I grew up in a small village, a countryside village called Lier, which is just in between the Norwegian capital of Oslo, and uh, a slightly larger city called Drammen, which we like to think of as the Detroit of Norway. Yes, so um, that explains a lot. And I grew up with my uh, father and mother and my brother in a small house there. Uh, my father's from Tromsø, so that's my connection to this part of the country. Uh, but. Um, yeah, so I grew up there in, in Lied, in a tiny village, I guess it's about, when I lived there, it's about 15,000 people, uh, in a very quirky street. Uh, my mother worked at a, a massive psychiatric hospital, which was just down the road, so everyone who worked, who lived on my street, all the parents either were psychologists, or nurses, or doctors, and uh, all our neighbours were hundreds and hundreds of crazy people, so uh, yeah, that's that's where I grew up. Yeah. Oh, you mentioned to me when we were preparing for this interview that things like I think it was the Great Garlic Girls, the Eurovision, and there was a TV talk show host that was very impactful for you. Yeah, Tell yeah, me yeah. About that. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, when I was teeny tiny, there was a children's television program, uh, kind of like our version of Sesame Street. Um, with two lovely uh, adults uh, living, not as a couple, in a little red cottage with a giraffe that hid and uh, they couldn't, could never see this giraffe. But I knew when I was a kid that the guy who played the male lead was gay. So he was the first person I knew was gay. His, his name was uh, Tarja. I knew he was gay and so I grew up with watching him on television as a little child knowing there existed gay people in the world and my parents were very uh, free and liberated so it wasn't like anything was kept hidden from me and like you mentioned the Great Garlic Girls is probably Norway's uh, most famous uh, drag uh, group. Uh, they, uh, they started, I think they really uh, became successful in the 80s. They were the, f I think they were the first mainstream drag performers in Norway. They were on television quite a lot. They were very glamorous, and they were the backup dancers for the Eurovision Song Contest for uh, uh, a guy called Kjetil Stockholm, who's here from from the north of Norway. He had a song called Romeo, and the Great Garlic Girls. Uh, this must have been around the time when the Amadeus film came out, okay. which I was obsessed with. The the Falco music video and everything to do with the Rococo period, I was completely enamored with. And the Great Garlic Girls performed at the Eurovision Song Contest final. Uh, we called it Grand Prix. They performed in high drag in these fabulous Rococo outfits, and uh, I was completely transfixed and very, very fascinated with them. So, so I was exposed to, uh, I didn't really, you know, connect at the time what gay was and, and that stuff because I hadn't had that awakening myself. I was just being myself. I loved dressing up. I loved playing with dolls and My Little Ponies and, 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 and what was considered girly toys and my parents let me. And um, so, yeah, I just, I just felt a natural affiliation with especially with the Great Gullicos, whenever they were on television, 
I would just be glued to the TV. And of course, every year, the Eurovision Song Contest final, the international final, was like the biggest, that was our Oscars, that was the biggest thing. It was so flamboyant and fabulous, and I absolutely loved it. So, so those were very formative things for me in terms of uh, feeling, feeling a sense of place and a sense of home whenever that happened on television, and I'm sure a lot of people have experienced this, when you see something on TV when you're very young that you connect with, you kind of feel, oh, this space is mine now. What's coming out of the TV is, this, this is my space now. And so, so yeah, that, that was the early, early, early starts of me discovering uh, uh, what homosexuality was. And of course, uh, I saw and was, I guess, both traumatized, terrified, and also very, very excited when I saw the Relax video for Frankie Goes to Hollywood oh, yes. on yes. television. And uh, I was very, I must have been like five, six maybe. And, uh, and there was just something about that video that just completely transfixed me. And I was so fascinated with it and very excited about it and very scared as well. And I mean, uh, uh, sexuality is terrifying when you're discovering it. So, uh, but that was the first time I think the, the more um, sexual feelings started to, to, to awaken when I saw that video. I would like to take a little bit of a step back because I, I'd like to know how you knew that the TV host was gay. Oh right, right. Um, I mean, I don't think I don't think he came out publicly publicly in, until the 90s when the when um, when the AIDS crisis was was uh, ravaging and it, it, it was happening in Norway as well and and he didn't have AIDS or HIV to my knowledge, but. I think he was outed around that time. Um, that's when the mainstream media started to write about gay issues. Uh, and Norway was very late, I think, in writing about AIDS and HIV. But, but I, I think I just kind of, I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember a specific moment where someone told me or anything. I just kind of, that's something that was just common knowledge that he was gay, I guess. And uh, I also knew we had some gay, a gay couple living uh, a couple of houses down from, from where I grew up as well. So I've always had a very kind of just a very natural um, um, natural experience about it. It's ne it was never like an aha moment that I can remember. Of course, I remember when I realized that I was gay. That was an aha moment. Uh, sitting on the toilet, I think, when I was around 11. And that's when I first first said it to myself, like, oh my God, you're gay. But, uh, but I, I don't think I remember exactly how I knew they were homosexuals. It's just something I, I knew, I guess. Well, you also mentioned the movie My Own Private Idaho. Oh yeah, that was, that was later. That was, in my, that was in my teens. And uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So um, uh, when I was a teenager, uh, uh, going to the video store was my absolute favorite thing, of course. And, uh, and I was obsessed with Keanu Reeves. I was in love with Keanu Reeves. So when, I think, I think the older brother of a, a good friend of mine, he had rented my own private Idaho because uh, the video shop in my little village had quite like, they had a lot of independent movies and stuff. It was really great. It was a great video store, a very formative place for me. And, and I remember seeing my own private Idaho uh, uh, and, and like I, I wanted to be them. I wanted to be these male hustlers at this point, I guess I must have been 15, maybe 16, and, and uh, I, I did had my sexual debut when I was 15 years old, and at the, around this time we also got the internet, so uh, I, I would just be completely obsessed with my own private Idaho and rent it. My fantasy was to like be this and stand at the, at the gas station in my little village. And, and be these like hustlers standing under the neon lights. And that's where we hung out, anyways. And I just, I just had this all these fantasies about being these like, uh, being a River Phoenix and being uh, Keanu Reeves in that movie. And of course, it was also lots of Shakespeare in it as well. So, and me and my friend Marty, we we loved Shakespeare films, Much Ado About Nothing, and all these things. So, so it was that part of it too. This kind of romantic uh, side to it. So I thought it was very romantic, uh, uh, that, that whole movie, actually. So, so yeah, I, I wanted to be a, a prostitute when I was 14, 15, yeah. But, but what about prostituting was so uh, attractive to you? 
I don't know. I just, I just, I think, I think I connected with them being outsiders in the movie, and and and, and until I connected the dots about, I, I didn't feel like an outsider particularly. I had lots of friends and stuff, but but it was really, it was just, I just found it so glamorous. This thought, I just thought it was so glamorous. Uh, I've always thought uh, prostitutes uh, and, and hustlers are, were very glamorous. I've always been fascinated with it. Uh, since I was a teenager, so and that progressed, of course, with uh, Bruce Le Bruce's film Hustler White and and these kinds of things, which I saw a little bit later. But yeah, no, I just, I just, and I love their style. They were so stylish and cool, and and yeah, so I went online and you know uh, uh, chatted with the uh, with guys that would. Uh, back at the time, I mean, we didn't uh, downloading a picture on the internet would take two days, so we didn't like see each other or anything, but. I was, I was on the internet by the age of 15, and I used it quite vigorously to get laid. Uh, and 15, 16, and uh, I would stand up the, at the bus stop and get picked up uh, in, and go into cars and, and having a good time and living my best, my own proud Idaho fantasy, yeah. Coming back to the issue of, of you getting picked up by people in cars and being driven around, I should think that's very dangerous. How were you getting away with that and, and managing to be safe doing that? Um, I think I, I've always had, because of where I grew up, with so many uh, different personalities around me connected to this psychiatric hospital that I grew up with, I've always had a very good sense about people, I could kind of tell, and I think even back then, I, I, of course I was naive and something dangerous could have happened, but I chatted with these people and I, uh, these men, and. I always kind of got the sense that they were terrified. They were very scared and very closeted, and mm. and I was definitely one, the one kind of taking charge of the situation, even when we were chatting. Okay. And I think I think the people who were predatory, they were they weren't um, they didn't have the capital, the cultural capital, to be online at that time in '95, '94. I think it was more educated, well-off people that had access to the, we weren't rich in any way, shape, or form, but right. I don't think the, the creeps had kind of gotten in there just yet. Uh, so maybe I just hit it at a very lucky, this wasn't something I did for years and years and years, it was just until I started to, to yeah, but uh, to, to go to gay bars or, or find other other guys to sleep within my community. I always had the sense that they they were okay and nice, and, and I was really excited about the potential. I mean, I thought it was just so exciting, and and uh, when I got into these cars, I just I I had complete control. It was it was these guys were very closeted, married men, I guess, who were uh, online, yeah. and yeah. I mean, having a computer in your house at that time wasn't someone uh, something everyone had, so. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I know nothing, nothing creepy ever, ever happened. Uh, I guess I was the creepy one a little bit, <laughs> if you think about it, because I was using them for my own benefit. But, and what was your benefit? Uh, just, just uh, uh, learning about having sex with guys, you know, and and uh, and getting getting laid. I mean, that was the benefit. I mean, uh, I couldn't. I, it wasn't that I was like in the closet or anything as a teenager. I came out when I was around 15 to my friends, I guess, and, and it was fine, it was no problem. And I also had sex with, with, with guys my own age, mostly straight guys who couldn't get girlfriends, and I found a way to exploit that situation. I guess a lot of people know, know can, can relate to that. Uh, so yeah, um, no, it was, and it was quite sweet actually, but thinking back on it, it wasn't, it wasn't anything really raunchy, it was a bit of mutual masturbation, and it was over very fast, and it was never like, full on, like, uh, no, it was, it was fine, and uh, I really had a good time, but, but uh, yeah, I did that for like, a year or two years, and, and then, you know, I moved on, and, and, and fell in love with a straight guy, my own age, of course, and then he was my entire world for, for about six years, oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. So, so that was the main focus then, and uh, yeah. So, no, maybe I was just lucky. I've been, I've been really lucky in my in my journey and coming out. I've had supportive uh, people around me. I've never been ostracized. I've always had friends, and uh, of course, I was bullied for being a bit feminine, a little bit bullied, not seriously bullied, just like regular bullying for being feminine in like. Uh, uh, preschool or uh, stuff yes. like that. So, but, yeah. 
but you know, I was, you know, I was, uh, I always, always had friends and always felt secure. So I've been really lucky, and in terms of this, these experiences with men and cars, I guess I was lucky there too. Uh, yeah. So it wasn't actually till like way later in life when I started going to gay bars that I encountered like the really scary, uh, the yeah. scary guys. You know, that yeah. that's 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 when that's when I when I quickly learned how to to filter that out. So yeah, no, it was fine. So tell us about your time in London. That was a very definitive time for you, a very um, opportunistic time for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us, tell us all about that. After I graduated from high school, I, I did my, uh, what, what, with the equivalent of, uh, I guess, A-levels, I did art, uh, uh, art in high school, and then I did one year at a, a performing arts school where I did set design and stuff, and, and then uh, I realized doing that that I wanted to, because uh, I was always up in the costume department okay. at this theater school, uh, so I realized, okay, you're not going to do set design, you should do something with clothes. I always loved fashion, and, and uh, I was lucky to have a mom and, and, and a grandmother who would sew me anything I wanted. I could design my own clothes, and, oh my gosh. and they would always make it wow. for me, and, and wow. yeah, it was great. So. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, like I said. So, but but my my mother and grandmother were very resourceful. So I could look at what the pop stars were wearing and point at it, and we would go and find a fabric. And so yeah, that's that's kind of like uh, I realized, okay, you can, I should do something in fashion. And London was the coolest place. This was sure. this was 1999, 2000. London was the place where everything was happening, and I was obsessed with all the magazines coming out from London and. So there was like uh, no question in my mind that I wanted to live there. I was obsessed with this Britpop uh, group called Pulp as well. Yeah. And their, their lyrics and how Jarvis Cocker wrote about English life. And I had such a romantic view of this. Like I literally wanted to sleep with common people and like that kind of area. <laughs> because I, I grew up kind of bourgeois, I guess. But, but yeah, I kind of wanted to go and like slum it a little bit in London. But also work in fashion. And at this time, anti-fashion was like a big thing as well, this movement where things didn't have to be too glamorous or anything. And I was really into that punk aesthetic, that anti-establishment fashion aesthetic. So London was the place. So yeah, I moved there. I started my three years, three year bachelor degree at, uh, it was then called the Surrey Institute of Art and Design. I think it's now called University of Creative Arts. They changed the name. Okay. Yeah, so so yeah, I went over there and, and, uh, and uh, just had the time of my life and uh, and quite early started, of course, any chance I had, I would go. I, the school, the, the university was in Epsom, which was about 40 minutes on the train outside of London, so I wasn't living in the city. Thank God I would never have graduated if I did. Uh, but, but any chance I had, whenever I had a little bit of money, I would just, because I had no money when I was in England, I would just get the train to London and go out and stay out all night. I would go out by myself all the time until wow. I started getting friends. And there was these fabulous, um, kind of uh, anti-establishment uh, clubs called Nag Nag Nag, and there was one called The Cock at the Ghetto, uh, and they were on on Thursday nights, and, and it was this whole environment growing up uh, uh, around the aesthetic of a very famous photographer called Wolfgang Tillmans, and also this magazine that came out called Butt Magazine, which was this sort of fancy esque magazine, which was a fabulous magazine. I think they just relaunched it, I guess. Oh. And, and, but this magazine became my new Bible, and, and, I, and I, uh, I went to the clubs where I knew that the people who worked at that magazine were, and uh, I also ended up working as the door bitch in some clubs, where oh. I would sit with the guest list and, uh, and, and make sure the right people came in and stuff. So. So yeah, London, London was fantastic. I got an internship at Attitude Magazine, which, yes. which is um, uh, the sort of the more high-end uh, you know, magazine for gay men in, in England and, and working in the fashion department there. And of course, uh, I was super skinny because I had no money for food. So I could, I could fit into like the sample size clothes that we would get from Milan and Paris. And we, we, we could borrow it, so I would go out in London with no money, in full Dior. Wow. Clothes worth tens of thousands of dollars and pounds, and just go out and have a great time. Um, wow. So yeah, that was, a, that was a fabulous time in London, yeah. and I love working at Attitude magazine. Yeah, L London was amazing, amazing time, a very exciting time. But sadly, I had to move back home immediately after I graduated, because you don't make any money working in fashion 
uh, once you graduate, because in London everyone sort of worked for free at that time, and you, you had to have five jobs, and I had to start paying my student loan, and so I had no choice but to move back to Norway after those three glorious years. But I think I lived about ten lifetimes in those three years, absolutely. Anything you wish you had done differently? Well, I, w I, wish, I wish I would have focused more on the, on the uh, facilities that were available at, at the university. I wish I would have learned more. We had amazing photo studios and cameras and everything. And the, my education became kind of tertiary to me because my tutors would actually encourage me to go out and connect and network. And they were like, yes, what we're doing here is important, but it's much more important to like actually make connections out in the fashion world so and i and i did that and and uh, but i wish i definitely wish i would have probably used especially the first two years studied a bit a bit harder i did really well in my third year i graduated with with the two one which is sort of the second best kind of level you can graduate but i uh, that was purely down to the fact that I had been out and had gotten all these influences. So I did stuff that no one else was doing uh, at my uni. That was way ahead of what anyone was even thinking about doing at that, at, at that university at the time. So, so I actually ended up getting uh, nominated for awards and, and this kind of stuff. So but I, had, I was on the, the path to doing quite well. And if I had parents who lived in England, I definitely would have stayed. But I probably wouldn't have survived because I loved I loved the nightlife way too much so, okay. yeah <laughs> so I think it was good that I, that I moved back to Norway yeah so let's take a quick step back right I'd like to go back to when you were beginning your initial uh, forays into uh, drag you were very young yeah, yeah. Was, tell us about that well yeah the, the first time I remember doing drag uh, was in my grandmother's garden uh, I think I must have been four years old, and my, my grandmother had a wonderful, wonderful, lovely garden with lots of fantastic flowers, and uh, she had all these amazing jewelries and stuff, so I think she kind of styled me into this lovely bejeweled princess, and we had a whole photo shoot all over the garden, and it was such a wonderful day, and uh, I loved it, so that's, I think that's the first time I did uh, drag, I guess, and and uh, a little bit later, when I started in the seventh grade, that's when you kind of stop going to the elementary school and you, you go up to, to with the older kids. Uh, my teachers asked me, do you want to do anything for the Christmas uh, ball, you know, the, the Yule ball? Because mm -hmm. uh, every, every year, uh, seventh, eighth and ninth grade would do some form of entertainment. And I was obsessed with Madonna at the time. Uh, and yes. uh, of course she had come out with uh, uh, her um, like a prayer album, and it was was around that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was definitely around the time when um, in bed with Madonna, which we called it, but um, the, the documentary that came out that oh, she yes. did, yes. and and all of that in Vogue, and all of that came out, and I was completely obsessed with it. So I said, yes, I'm going to be Madonna, and at the at the school ball, and so I performed. Express yourself in full drag. At that, at this time, I was still I hadn't grown, so I was very, very tiny. I was yeah. one of the tiniest kids in my year, and uh, I actually had, coming back to the Rococo period fascination, I had like a Amadeus wig oh. from when I was younger, so that became my curly blonde hair, and I styled myself. I remember, and I had a little mini skirt and a lace blouse, and I used toilet roll as tits, and then I got two girls uh, in my class who uh, went to dance uh, school, and we dressed them up in gray suits, so they were the men, and they did, were like my backup dancers, and we did Express Yourself. I lip synced to it in front of my entire school, completely fearless, I have no idea how I had the guts to do it, but I guess I, I, I felt safe and, and, and happy. And um, it was a massive hit, no one filmed it or took pictures, because oh. no, one, no one did back then. Uh, but, but yeah, so that was like my first drag performance, and. And uh, looking back, that, that was the moment where I kind of knew that uh, I had a place and no one could like really touch me because uh, it was such a big success and I completely stole the show. And, uh, but uh, yeah, but I didn't do drag again for many, many years until after I moved back to Norway. Uh, I, did a I tried a little bit of drag in London just, just as a photo shoot experiment for a project, but uh, my, uh, yeah, so when I moved back to Norway again, and this was 2004, 2005, okay. that's when I uh, uh, got to do drag a little bit more, yeah, so. You said the uh, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. 
were very, very influential to you. Tell us about that. Right, right. So the, uh, I, I, it's just a perpetual indulgence. Um, uh, I discovered uh, not many years ago, actually. So, so. Uh, uh, I knew, I'd seen pictures of Sister Roma around on the internet and I was always fascinated by her aesthetic and very, I just thought she looked so powerful. So uh, on my journey towards becoming Lady Di, which is my drag persona now, uh, I definitely took a lot of inspiration once I discovered what the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence was, what they were doing, like their community work. So this, I actually like discovered them when I moved here. So that's... Okay fairly recent, I guess about five years ago, that I started, that, that's, that planted the seed in my mind that, hmm, I could do something here in Tromsø with this. There's, there's no one doing drag here really in, the, in this city. There was drag queens that I discovered around Tromsø that, that were doing drag and we found each other later. Me and my queer friends, we would just sit and always complain about there wasn't enough queer stuff happening here. So when the pandemic hit, I was like, fuck it, this is the time. Now we're gonna start with drag here in Tromsø. Drag is very uh, COVID friendly. We can have drag bingos and I can also start creating these queer spaces outside of Arctic Pride, which is basically the only time of the year back then, kind of. There was a couple of things, but Arctic Pride, the Arctic Pride Week was kind of the only thing that was like a gay and a queer, queer gathering space. So. So yeah, so inspired by what I saw when, when I saw that the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence actually did community outreach work, uh, work outside of just being entertainment and performance, that kind of clicked for me because I always wanted to, to find an outlet to, to do something for the queer community. Why did you come to Tromsø? Oh yeah, why I came to Tromsø? I was uh, doing really well in Oslo. I think I kind of finished in Oslo. I, that's very typical me. Once I succeed at something, I pull, like to pull the rug underneath my own feet and, and, and restart to, to challenge myself. I hate complacency. Uh, so the last job I had in Oslo was at this amazing luxury department store. And I basically reached the, like, the zenith of the fashion scene. I would go to all these fabulous events and blah, blah, blah. And I really had made it in the fashion world in Oslo. The, but on my own terms, kind of. But but there was also there was also things in Oslo that were too positive for me. I was doing a lot of drugs back when I when I lived there, and and I was drinking quite heavily. And I thought, okay, um, maybe a change of scenery is good. And I wanted to connect with my uh, uh, heritage up here, up in the north. That that had always been in the back of my head. And every time I came to Tromsø, visited my father, I would see the city evolve and evolve and evolve and grow and grow and grow. I've been coming here since since the 80s. So when I started coming back, maybe 10, 14 years ago, I really saw, oh, Tromsø is exciting. There's stuff happening here. So I thought, hmm, maybe I should stop competing for shit uh, styling gigs in Oslo, where I make no money, and I can go up to Tromsø, where there's no one like me, and and I did, and uh, I just did it. On like, it wasn't a. I didn't think about it too much. I just did it. I just. My gosh! Yeah. Wow. And uh, I had no network here, and yeah. So yeah, that's that's why I ended up at Tromsø. My first job was at the Salvation Army uh, uh, charity shop. That's the first job because a friend of mine worked for them. And he was like, "You can go work there." And so yeah, that's that's when I started my my Tromsø days. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> now. Tell us about the birth of Lady Di. Right, right, yeah. So, so it was the pandemic. I was uh, binge watching RuPaul's Drag Race like crazy, <laughs> and uh, I was thinking I, I had done some drag, some pretty countercultural, punky drag uh, with a designer in Oslo called Baron von Bulldog, and I'd been part of his drag entourage. And I was like, oh, I, I miss that kind of drag. And I saw that the drag that was happening in Norway. That, that I that I was aware of, was very kind of uh, vanilla, very very safe. And like I said, was uh, had, was getting a bit obsessed with the uh, Sister Roma and the Sister of Perpetual Indulgence and their look, and also of course uh, the, the, the 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 new romantic look. Because Lady Di usually is full white face, and I keep my beard and I paint it black and, okay. and that kind of thing. So. So like I thought, that. okay, I'm 42, um, I was 41 years old then, and I thought, okay, I want to start doing drag, but I want a drag face that would look fabulous when I'm 60 and 70, and because I want to do this uh, for the rest of my life now. Yes. 
and I started very late doing it professionally, so I thought, okay, with the white clown face, I mean, you can get away with pretty much anything. I, Lady Di will look, look, look fabulous in her 70s, so, so that's where that makeup came from. I'm not wearing it tonight. Uh, maybe underneath, we will see later, maybe. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I, I was also watching a lot of The Crown, obviously, and the, the whole Diana storyline came mm. through, and, mm. and it just kind of clicked, and, and I was like, okay, Lady Di, Lady Di. And, and uh, I, I have a lot of feminist friends who, you know, have had their views on what drag is, and, and of course there have been problematic um, more masochistic po uh, points in drag. In yes. drag. So, kind of want to play a little, a little play on words there. That yeah, we want all women to die. We just want to rule the planet as drag queens. So, lady die. So that's that's a little bit of a joke. And uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, so yeah, I kind of I had all these fantastic clothes that I collected over the years. And I wasn't doing any styling gigs. I was working as a stylist, uh, freelance at that time, two years ago. I, this is 2020. So I was like, okay. And, and the, the, the artists that I work with here styling and in Norway in general never wants to go all the way. And I was tired of that, that as well. So okay, I'll be my own star. I'll style myself and okay. I can just create any looks I want. And I can also make money during the pandemic because we can have drag bingos. People can sit at their tables. Yes. It will be something new. And, uh, and we're here, and, and so yeah, that's, that's kind of why, why I was maybe a bit opportunistic, but it was a huge success, and we got a flying start, so we've done so much over the last two years. Well, what are Lady Di's motivations? How do you, what do you see her doing? Um, I see her being like a, a lightning rod okay. for the energy of drag here in the Arctic, and, and that was my goal. I wanted to make it into a business and, and create like someone had to start doing drag here in Tromsø. I mean, people have done drag here before, but but I also wanted to, to you know, you know, throw my hat in the ring and also see what, who came out of the woodwork and maybe we could create a more visible queer artistic scene here in Tromsø and in the north. And uh, my goal was always to like that I wouldn't be like the star. I would be the lightning rod that would bring the light here, uh, and then the other kids and the other guys and girls could come and start doing drag and then I could become the megalomaniac manager and take commissions and send them out on gigs and that's what I'm doing now, yes. Fantastic. <laughs> How many people have you been able to gather in this community? Well, yeah, I started, I started in drag, we have what we call houses, so yes. I wanted to create a house, so I called it House of Misfits. And uh, we, we launched with the House of Misfits with my Danish friend Mikkel, who performs as Nefentis. She was my kind of partner in crime. And then we start, started uh, connecting with drag queens in other cities around Tromsø, like Harstad, Sotlam, and Alta. And uh, any time, any chance I would have to, to book them and get them to come to Tromsø and do drag, I, I would take it. And, and that's kind of where it started. So now we are. We are a little crew of four four drag performers. Oh, okay. That okay. Uh, that we we travel around here and and uh, they they of course have done drag themselves for years without me. It wasn't me who like inspired them to do it. So I was very lucky that they wanted to come and work with me. And, and now we work together. And sometimes there's two of us. Sometimes there's all of us. Sometimes so I book a gig for s uh, someone else. Uh, and yeah, so the. the yeah, the, the ball is really rolling now. We've done tons and tons of, of gigs this year. I'm going to do a lot more next year. How's the community responding to this? Um, well, it's, in, it's interesting. We have, we, we have a sort of very kind of vague queer community here in Tromsø. We have little groupings. It's growing because we have now a queer night here at Driv where we are, which is uh, uh, once a month, which is super important. So now we can actually start seeing, there's also the university, but there's no, we don't have a gay bar or a lesbian, we don't have a queer bar or place 24 seven, we don't. Right. So that's, that's really what is missing. So we don't really have like a strongly knit community all year round. We kind of meet up in little um, bursts of queerness okay. <laughs> occasionally. So, yeah. but uh, because of RuPaul's Drag Race, the, the cis straight girls are obsessed with drag and they love coming. So I would, I would, get, I would venture like the main audience is cis uh, straight girls. No kidding, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, 
And they pay, they pay, they pay, so they, they, you know, they want to come and see us, so. So yeah, but we definitely have people from the queer community that I see showing up to gigs and stuff, and, and we're doing, I've, I've got some money from the, from the county now to, to start an outreach program for uh, teenagers up to, uh, from the age of 13 to 20, and we're gonna, we're gonna start some things. So hopefully I can I can grow more and more drag performers here. Yeah. Start things. What does that mean? Well, no, yeah. We, uh, we start. I'm starting a program with um, with uh, a, a youth club called Grab, and uh, so we're we're trying to recruit there and create a little group. Uh, uh, and I'm I've got community. I've got money from the from the county to to do that for all of 2023. So this is a brand new project. It hasn't even been launched yet. My gosh. Yeah. So, but they, they gave me lots of money to to and money to buy drag for these people as well. We want to keep it very very low uh, threshold to start with it because yeah. it costs a lot of money. And a lot of people yeah. think they only know drag from drag race. So they they think these people are new, but they don't realize that. The people who are on Drag Race have been doing drag for 10, 15, 20, 30 years yes. before they show up to the, that TV the show. Program. So I want to create where, okay, we're going to start the journey here. We're going to learn. You're going to find your expression. So this is just beginning now. So my dream is that it's going to be like a drag tsunami happening. Anywhere. How absolutely fascinating that the uh, municipality is so benevolent toward you to be able to do this. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> Well, well, uh, Trums Trumse is a progressive city, and uh, uh, the municipality isn't afraid to take risks, either be, be it uh, at how they plan and build their city. They, they like to set kind of blue sky, hairy goals kind of thing, uh, but, but I applaud them for it. They're very, they, they love innovation up here, and also the, because there has been such a lack of activity for queer people and queer youth, uh, we kind of like we kind of kind of said like enough is enough and yeah and but they've also I mean the, the municipality has worked on uh, creating a plan of, of how to 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 grow grow it here it, and yes. I just I knew they had this plan so I just and they wanted me to do one workshop and I said there's no way you can learn to do drag in one workshop yeah. give me this amount of money we're going to do it every month for one year we can't just do, make it a one-off we have to make it a big thing and they said yes. Interesting that you bring that up because this morning I was able to attend uh, an event, I guess, at the city hall in the parliamentary <laughs> hall, and they were talking about involving a drag queen for educational purposes starting next year. Is that's, that you? That, that is me. Yes. I thought it would be. Uh -huh. I thought so. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. I find that absolutely amazing. Well, now good because now it's on record. There, they haven't paid the invoice yet. So, okay. uh, but, but I know, I know, I know the funds, and they gave me a, a good, good amount of money to do it as well, so we could do something properly. Incredible. So my go my goal is to to make these kids put up their own drag show for Arctic Pride uh, next year. But how are you going to recruit the kids to do this? Uh, we'll, we just have to try and create spaces for them and and. Uh, I think the best way is to actually show them some drag. So sure. I'm going to use some of this money to get my my drag performers, and we're going to do a show for them. Because once we've done, we've done, we did a show at the youth club in Alta, which is up in way more up north than here, and it was a smashing success. Wow! And it really wow. brought everyone together there. Even the people, the people who work there were flabbergasted because drag is such a unifier. Because wow. the straight kind of tough guys, once they see what we're actually doing. They get fascinated by it, like, oh my God, a man can do that, and and, uh, and we, of course we we have drag kings as well. We have women, cis yeah. women doing drag, yeah. and, and 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 queer women doing drag. Um, but but we are we are we are cis men doing drag at the moment. Uh, but but yeah, so um, it's a great unifier, and we're so the 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 performance I have with me, they're so fierce and talented and amazing. Wow. And, and stunning and really, really good. So people can't help but being utterly fascinated. It's like a deer in the headlight kind of moment for them. So um, yeah, it, it, it really is, Ripple says it all the time, the power of drag, it brings people together. And it really does, it really does, yeah. How fascinating, fascinating. Now, what have been your greatest achievements in all of this? Huh, I have to think about that. The greatest achievement? I think I think it has been meeting meeting the the drag queens I work with. Okay. Uh, absolutely. Uh, um, I felt very uh, since I was the only one doing it here, working so hard. But they've been so great, and 
it's been it's been amazing to get to know these performers. They're they're much more into performing than I am. I, I like making the look and wow. and doing the fashion and stuff. And yeah. uh, I, I would be quite content just sitting on the side of the stage looking amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, but now I have these amazing performers who come and they do amazing things, and it's so cool to see them becoming more and more professional and and inspired and talented. So I think that's that's the biggest achievement, and that we have had multiple sold out gigs here in Tomsa, yeah, which yeah. is historic. There's n nothing yeah. like that has ever, of course, Arctic Pride has had drag shows here during Arctic Pride, which has been a huge success, but we've been able to do it in other kinds of venues, and, and we've, even, we've even, you know, we did the Norwegian Fishermen's Union had oh, us at their- Oh my concert. gosh. Um, the greatest challenge is to make a business out of it and learning that. I've never done anything like that. I've never been, a booking agent or worked with contracts in that way so that that's the that's the biggest challenge and also making it financially viable and uh, and, and yeah. getting the money we need yeah. to perform because uh, uh, we have to it, the drag is expensive and yes and we work yes we were on stage for half an hour but there's hours before that getting ready and also yes. hours afterwards so it's all about getting and really standing my ground and saying, no, you're going to pay us this or else we won't come and do your gig. Right. Uh, in Oslo, they struggle with it. A lot of drag performers there do stuff for free, but I've said to my performers, we're not going to do that. We're, we're going we're gonna to be, gonna be taken seriously. We're going to get paid to do it. So, Good. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, the greatest challenge has been, and it still is challenging to kind of figure out all the financial things about it and taxes and what we can deduct and all that. I'm terrible at those things, but um, but yeah, that, that's probably the biggest challenge. Yeah. Now, what would you do with Lady Die if you knew you could not fail? Oh, um, I would probably make her into like a, a AI virtual reality character that could just live oh, wow. in the meta world verse and rule there, and I could just sit at home in my pajamas and watch Star Trek <laughs> and not have to go and get dressed and do all the things. <laughs> I do enjoy it, but yeah, no, the ultimate goal would be to make, make her virtual and uh, make her the queen of the metaverse, yeah. <laughs> Is there anything Lady Di will not do? Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's some political parties here in Tromsø, here in Norway, that I would never, ever, ever work for. Uh, even it doesn't matter how much money they paid me, I would never show up mm. and do anything for them. Uh, the the more right side of the political spectrum, but it's even the yeah. So I I, I don't think I want want to do anything that has to do with politicians. I fucking hate politicians. Even though they give me money, they're great. Thank you very much. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess we need them in our social democracy. But uh, but yeah, um, yeah. I, I no, she wouldn't do that. She wouldn't. She wouldn't go to a Christmas party for the uh, right wing assholes. No. Wow. Even though they paid her a fortune, I just wouldn't. And uh, and yeah, yeah, no, I wouldn't do that. And I would never, I would, maybe I would never say no to anyone who wanted to do drag, regardless of who they were. Building on everything you've been telling me so far in all of these uh, different facets of your community, there has to be someone somewhere that's going to see this video someday what advice can you offer that person who is new or exploring the drag community? I like, okay, I, I like to use the image of a, a blender. And I, I want to teach people that, you know, what you can do with drag is, is uh, you can take everything you love and put it into your drag. You don't have to do what everyone else is doing. That's what's great about drag as an art form is you can take any weird thing you love or any mainstream thing you love and you can put it into a drag blender and make a drag smoothie and that could be a drag expression. So if you love musicals, but you, you're shit at singing, you can do that in the drag because you can lip sync it. Or, so I'm like, take everything you, everything you really love and put that into your drag journey in, into your little blender and make that. So it could be the weirdest things, your weirdest references, Put it in there and make that your drag, because that's that's gonna that's gonna you can do all the things you you've dreamed of doing, but that you couldn't do for any sorts of limitations, I guess. So 
So it's like, don't, don't, don't focus too much. This is actually going back to my university. Sorry, I'm rambling a bit. Not at all. But one of the most important lessons I learned going to a fashion university was I, I grew up reading fashion magazines and that was, for me, that was the most important thing, reading fashion magazines. But my tutor in my first year, she said to me, Rune, stop reading fashion magazines right now because what you see there was planned and done six months ago. It's already over, it's done, the industry has moved on. Stop reading them, start reading books, start reading older fashion magazines from 20 years ago. Look to movies, look to art, but stop reading fashion magazines. And I, could, I think you can apply that to your drag as well. Like, stop, wow. stop obsessing about what's happening on Drag Race, what's happening on Instagram, what's happening on TikTok. Figure out, find other sources of inspiration. Find sources of inspiration within yourself and your interests, and then you will have fabulous drag. Yeah. So why did you choose this particular ensemble for this evening? Well, uh, it's a little in your honor, Doug. I wanted to. Thank you. I wanted to do a little bit of leather, and um, so uh, uh, and I wanted to be a little, a little bit more kinky. There's a lot of references going on here. I've been obsessed with the George Michael video for Father Figure and ah. these wonderful women with these fabulous blazers walking in it. So I was channeling a bit of that. Uh, we wanted to use this bunny mask forever. I just thought the gimp mask by itself was kind of, uh, you know, we've seen that before. <laughs> and, um, there's also a little bit of Lee Bowery going on with the lips and, and, and stuff. And, but mostly it's, it's, it's in your honor um, for, and, and all and all the leather community always show up, show up from all over the world here at Tom Sephardic Pride, and I think it's so fabulous when you guys are here. And uh, so yeah, I wanted to do a little bit of uh, homage to that. Thank you, that's very <laughs> kind. What's the biggest misconception about you? About me? Yes. Um, maybe, maybe, yeah, uh, I, think, I think the biggest misconception is that I am uh, not afraid of anything. And and very boisterous. I am. I am actually quite an introvert in, in many ways. I'm a I'm a Cancerian through and through. Uh, but people see me as the lion. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, I'm riddled with anxiety and self doubt. I suffer from wow. incredible bouts of imposter syndrome. Even though wow. I've been extremely successful, uh, it doesn't take a lot to to tip that scale into completely doubting myself and everything I do. Um, I work alone most of the time uh, in my business as well. So uh, yeah, but I, I've been training to not listen to those voices and, uh, and hear them and see them, but tell them to just, okay, I see you just, but fuck off, we're, we're doing the good thing. So, so yeah, I don't think a lot of people know that, that I'm, a, I'm cripplingly insecure about wow. whatever I do. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> Well, Lady Di, Rune, the Driv Bar here in Tromsø, Norway, and Arctic Pride, on behalf of Inside Leather History of Fireside Chat, I thank you.